machines can't think as people do. The machine is different. So tonight's movie uh, has uh, nothing whatsoever to do with science, but I, I will talk about science a little bit and authentication. This is a very strange movie. For those of you that, and will, that have seen it before will understand that. And uh, not very well received when it came out, but its fortunes have risen as time has gone by, as you can see if you, if you like what Rotten Tomatoes says. And I'm sure everyone here will be a big fan of this movie afterwards and will want to go buy the two-disc Criterion Collection uh, set that includes uh, other related films and interviews that actually uh, adds a lot of background to the movie because it's a very non-linear movie and, and there's a lot of missing details about some of the characters involved if, if you're coming to this movie without having a previous background. Main character in the movie is this fellow, Elmir Dohori. Uh, I like that quotation, it's his own kind of statute of limitations, <laughs> which not too many people would, would agree with. But he, by his own account, forged over a thousand paintings in a 30-year career. And it's claimed that some of his forgeries are still hanging in museums or in private collections uh, without the knowledge of their owners. Don't know whether that's the case or not. I'm not aware of any scientific studies that have actually been carried out on Dehori's paintings, but I would imagine that some of them could be fairly easily identified as forgeries by, by scientific analysis. How to approach authenticating works of art by science. Doesn't matter what kind of work of art, period, place, time. There's uh, really only two ways to do that. It would be great if there were direct approaches to answer all questions about authenticity. A direct approach would give you the date when something was made, but unfortunately there's very few such techniques, and even when there is such a technique, as you'll hear in a few minutes, there can be a lot of problems in interpreting the data from the technique. Indirect approaches are more common, Indirect approach would look at the materials used to make a particular artifact and how those materials are mixed together, shaped, worked, and then uh, taking what's been identified in the questionable object and comparing those findings with what should be present in an, in an object of that type or origin or artist's origin. For uh, older artifacts, we can also look at weathering or deterioration phenomena. Uh, older objects have been buried in the ground frequently, and uh, that produces changes in many materials, and we can look at the changes that have occurred and see if they're what we would expect for something that's that old and, and been sitting in the ground for a long period of time, for example. So I have four stories tonight, two very famous, uh, well-known uh, international stories and two um, relatively little-known stories from the MFA's collections. And uh, I'll begin with the Vinland map, which some of you may know about. This is um, a uh, ink map on parchment, which uh, Yale um, University uh, Beinecke Library purchased in 1965. They announced to great fanfare that this was uh, a map, the first map that showed North America. And uh, the map was dated to the 1440s, according to them. Uh, part of North America that's shown was called Vinland. It's that little uh, island off there to the west of Greenland. and um, Vinland was uh, discovered by the Vikings, the story goes, and this map then includes information that dates back to the Vikings, uh, information from a few hundred years before the map itself was produced. Uh, immediately when this map appeared uh, in, in a book that was published at the same time as Yale announced its purchase, there were questions about its authenticity. And the whole story about the study of this piece from many different points of view is very complicated. Many books, many articles, many websites devoted to it. And um, I'll only talk about one uh, aspect of the scientific study here this evening. First of all, it's an ink drawing on parchment. So to scientifically authenticate something like this, we could look at the parchment and we could look at the ink. Looking at the parchment can be done by a technique called radiocarbon dating that was carried out. Parchment dates to the, the early 15th century, that's correct. On the other hand, forgers of documents are well known to find old pieces of paper, parchment, wood, canvas, and do their forgery on top of that so that the substrate will pass the radiocarbon tests and other kinds of tests. So uh, the fact that the parchment came from the early 1400s uh, didn't convince a lot of people that it was authentic. 
So the other material in the, in the uh, map left to look at is the ink. Uh, map should have been drawn with something called iron, all ink, iron gall ink. It's a cheap, easily manufactured ink. It's what would have been used in the medieval period in Europe. Close up iron gall ink uh, as, is, a, is a, a dark brown aged iron gall ink. And it has a little yellow halo, so to speak, or a little yellow um, um, border around it. As you can, you can see in a slightly fuzzy picture of an 1877 signature done in iron gall ink. And that little yellow border is due to some of the ink components sinking into the surrounding paper or parchment and then oxidizing and reacting. So you should see that. On first examination, the ink in the Venland map did look like that. There was the yellow, there was the darker ink centers. On closer examination, though, it appeared to some people, uh, not everyone, that this map was actually drawn in two stages. First stage was yellow ink, and on top of that, a black ink line was drawn so that it would look like real iron gall ink from a distance to the sort of casual observer, although it's not too convincing in close-ups like this of a part of the... The black ink itself is flaked off at a lot of the map, so now the map is lighter colored than it was at one time. And uh, furthermore, the chemical composition of the ink is, uh, doesn't even remotely resemble that of iron gall ink. So there's, there's an agreement that it's not, not made of iron gall ink. What was found by analysis is that the ink itself contains titanium, the element titanium, which is not in the parchment itself. And uh, one of the uh, scientists who studied this, this, uh, this map, was able to take samples of the ink. And he found that the titanium is present in little tiny grains of a crystalline compound called anatase. That's a form of titanium dioxide, one of, the, one of the natural forms of that particular compound, titanium dioxide. And looked at at very high magnification, the particle sizes and shapes were virtually identical to the particle sizes and shapes of one of the forms of modern titanium white pigment, which was invented in the 1920s. This one form of titanium dioxide pigment also contains anatase. There's a picture of that at the bottom. That convinced many people that the ink itself was, was uh, not medieval, couldn't possibly be medieval, so consequently the map couldn't be medieval in origin. A geologist pointed out that anatase is a naturally occurring mineral. Like many minerals, it occurs in beautiful large grains, as you see in this, this specimen. But most of the anatase in nature is present in little tiny particles and sediments. And the geologists argued that these little tiny particles could have been collected from a sediment and put in the ink by some means or the other. So just because the uh, anatase is in fine grains doesn't mean that it, it couldn't have been a natural component added to the ink by a medieval manufacturer, although not too many people accept that argument. Then there have been additional arguments, very convoluted, about how an iron gall ink could have been made from a titanium-containing iron mineral. That's a very convoluted argument that not too many people accept. So uh, if you read the Yale website today, uh, they still um, state that it is a, a genuine map from the 1440s, but they do note that there's some controversy about it. And again, uh, if you wish to read about this, there's many, many, many websites and multiple books that have been written on the subject and many different points of view about its authenticity. And by the way, uh, what does that little island represent? Uh, what part of uh, North America? Probably part of northern Canada and uh, maybe including the Gulf of St. Lawrence that you see uh, shown in the map here. The second object I wanted to talk about for a couple minutes is the Shroud of Turin, believed by many to be the shroud in which Jesus Christ was buried. The history of the Shroud of Turin goes back to the later part of the 14th century to a church in northern France in a place called Lyrae. That's the first mention of it, and it was known continually since that time. There's no record of it before that particular time. In the um, 1970s, the Vatican uh, offered unprecedented uh, or, or um, approved an unprecedented scientific study of the Shroud of Turin. A number of scientists from different places, including the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in, in, in California in the United States, were uh, allowed access to the Shroud of Turin, and they studied it from many, many different points of view, from all kinds of scientific points of view. One thing that was done is a small piece of fabric was taken from the edge of the Shroud of Turin. It was cut into three snippets, three little pieces, and they were sent to three different radiocarbon dating labs around the world. Uh, each of those labs came up with the same result. And this is a, whoops, I, um, to back up, I forgot I had the picture. I, I didn't show the entire shroud as it looks like. The top picture is 
the Shroud of Turin more or less as you would see it if you were able to go see it. It's not on display very often. It was last on display for a couple months last summer and probably will not be on display again for a number of years. And, um, it was stored in a folded condition for a lot of its history and uh, there was a fire at one time and it was, the fire was doused with water. So the holes you see, the, the, the triangular holes are damages from the fire and some water stains. The image itself is of a man, the front and back view of a man who's about six feet tall. You can barely see the image of the man on the shroud itself. It shows up much better in a photographic negative like you see at the bottom, that's the front view of the man. The man seems to have wounds on his hands folded across his abdomen and his feet and on his head. This is the uh, British group that carried out radiocarbon dating, looking uh, very solemn and scientific there. <laughs> and uh, on the chalkboard behind them is the date that they found from their analysis, which the other two labs agreed with. And um, curiously enough, this date uh, corresponds very well with the first known documentary mention of the, uh, of the shroud, that is the, the uh, church in northern France, Lyrae when it is first mentioned, I think, in the 1360s, 1370s, 1380s. This convinced many people, these radiocarbon dates, that the shroud couldn't possibly be a shroud of Jesus Christ or anybody else from before the Middle Ages, and thus was a forgery. However, almost immediately, some people began questioning the, the uh, validity of the radiocarbon dating, not, not the validity of the actual dating process, but one of the problems with radiocarbon dating is that it's, uh, it's subject to contamination. If you have restorations that are present, or even if you have biodeterioration present, some of those things, if they're not carefully removed from the sample that's tested by the laboratory, you'll get a spurious result. Uh, you won't get the result of the actual fabric in this case. You'll get a result that's due to the carbon in the fabric and carbon added later during restorations. So in other words, you get a time that isn't related to the original, and thus your date is not very useful. And that's an argument that's been made by many people about the radiocarbon dating of the shroud. The sample is from an area of restoration. Some people claim this could be solved by further radiocarbon testing, but that hasn't been approved, and, and it's hard to say whether that will ever be approved uh, anytime soon. The image itself has been the subject of many, many articles and considerable arguments among many, many scientists. Many theories about what the image is due to, and there's no agreement about this, some very fanciful theories have been developed by scientists, and it makes very interesting reading. If any of you are, are, um, want to pursue this a little bit further, and uh, you can find it all on the internet, a lot of the articles, the published articles on the internet. This is a detail of the face of the man. The eyebrows are the dark horizontal line at the top. The red spots are, are blood stains, and there does appear to be blood in these spots. This is where a crown of thorns, for example, could be present on the head. But there's no telling whether the blood was present when the image was formed or was added later because this object has been known and venerated for centuries and centuries and has undergone some restoration. Part of the problem with looking at the image is it might have touch-ups on it from later periods of time. One scientist in the original research group argued that it was a painting based on his analysis and he was very good with uh, the sample, very good analyst with the samples he took. But other people have contested this now. And again, there are many theories about how the image arises. Most people don't think it's a painting, but aren't really sure how it, how it arose. It's, and it is very faint. The eyebrows, as I mentioned, are that line there. The centers of the eyes are the slightly darker spaces below and around the, um, the area around the eyeballs are the little wider areas. And that's typical of the image in most of the object. So, uh, Many people still believe that the shroud is authentic and there's no particular reason to doubt that, frankly, at this point in time, even from a scientific point of view. It depends on what you think of the evidence that's been gathered and how you interpret it because there are scientists on both sides of the question. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory scientists felt that it was an authentic object, the, the original research group scientists. Others have pointed out that they, were, they, were, they came from a Catholic background and that may have been some wishful thinking on their part, so even that argument has been made. But the story is a very complicated one and, and, uh, and can be an interesting one, a uh, um, tedious one to plow through all the evidence. So finally, I want to move on to two little objects from the Museum of Fine Arts collections. Many of you that uh, know the Museum of Fine Arts may never have seen these two objects uh, ever before. They're not on display, haven't been on display for years. 
The um, one on the left is about six inches tall. She's made out of ivory and has some gold decorations. If authentic, the object's 3,500 years old and dates to the Minoan culture. The one on the left is a little bigger, about nine inches tall. It's made of amber with some gold decoration. And if it's authentic, it's about 2,800 years old. To begin with the, the ivory woman, in, in 1903, Arthur Evans, archaeologist, ex, uh, excavated Knossos Crete. This was the capital city of the ancient Minoan Empire. The ancient Minoan Empire was, had been lost in history at the time that he began his excavations. He rediscovered an ancient, very important civilization. And that civilization captivated public imagination and was the subject of newspaper, art, newspaper articles in uh, popular journals, popular journal articles, and so forth. And among the artifacts he found were two little statues, including the one at the right, which is heavily restored now, of uh, women with typical Minoan uh, dresses, um, costumes on, holding snakes. Uh, nobody's really sure what exactly these figures mean or what they're doing. It might have something to do with the religious ceremony. But they, they demonstrated to a lot of people that women were very important in the ancient Minoan culture. And women were apparently not so important in most other ancient cultures. And that's part of the fascination with the Minoan culture made it different than most other ancient cultures that were known at that time. Within about 10 years or so of the, uh, of the first excavations, a number of other snake goddesses appeared on the market. They don't have good provenance, can't be traced back to excavations, so no, no telling exactly where they came from. And the one at the MFA uh, looked like this when it came to the MFA. Even how it got to the MFA, is, there's two or three stories about that. But uh, it did look like this when it came. It, this statue, it, it wasn't broken, it was simply made in a number of different pieces that were then slotted together, a number of pieces of ivory slotted together, and then the gold pieces. And it also has some restoration on it. The ivory was in very fragile condition, and when it got to the MFA and, and another time since then, it's been treated with wax. The, the um, pieces of ivory were put in a vat of melted wax. That was a very common treatment for, for archaeological ivory as well as wood for many, many years as a way of strengthening it with an inert compound or material like wax. Unfortunately, the wax gets into the the raw material, the ivory in this case, and it's virtually impossible to get out, and that makes radiocarbon dating um, virtually impossible to carry out uh, and, and to get a good result of uh, from it on, on this particular object because the wax would be interfering and it's pretty hard to, or impossible to totally get rid of the wax. And it was treated twice with a couple different types of wax to make it complicated. Beeswax, which is a modern uh, insect wax, and a mineral wax. So who knows what the radiocarbon date would, would mean? Not much of anything probably on this object, at least with the cleaning techniques available at this time. So all that we could do to really study this piece was look at the gold. And the uh, gold turned out to have a composition which didn't keep, seem consistent with uh, Bronze Age gold from other published analyses of, um, of gold, excavated gold pieces from that particular period of time. This study was undertaken at the request of a professor who was at Boston University at that time named Chemist LePatton, and he wrote a book on the snake goddesses, the MFAs and the other ones. You can see the MFA one on the front cover of his book here. This is a, a very interesting book to read. Uh, I met him during this study and talked with him many times, and I think the book is very, is very compelling. But his argument is that all the snake goddesses, the MFAs and all the other ones without provenance, were fakes and they were salted into the market because there was a market for them at that period of time. The fascination with them and uh, um, people at museums had uh, blinders on about the authenticity of them. They really wanted one, they became available. They took them without perhaps doing as much due diligence and research as maybe they should have done. Anyway, that's his argument. And if they are fakes, who made them? He argues that the person primarily responsible is the second man from the left here, um, Gilles Illiron, not pronouncing his name correctly, but he was an artist and restorer who actually worked for Evans during the excavations on Crete. And um, Le Patton's argument is that this person and some of his co-workers found pieces of ivory and created these snake goddesses and then put them into the art market to make a little money for themselves and to satisfy uh, a real need for objects at that time since there are only two genuine snake goddesses ever found uh, during excavations. 
The second object then is this, is this um, amber figure. The MFA purchased this in 1938, and it was purchased as an amber statuette of Asher Nasser Paul II. Uh, Asher Nasser Paul II was a rather ruthless empire builder from uh, 9th century BC Assyrian times. And uh, his uh, big claim to fame, aside from um, rather gruesome captures of surrounding territories, which you can read about if you care to, was his uh, capital city, which was built at Nimrod. Nimrod's uh, not too many kilometers south of Mosul and is a city which apparently has been partially destroyed by uh, ISIS in, in the last couple of years. But there are bits and pieces, sometimes rather large ones, in a number of museums around the world. These are, these are some pieces of Nimrod in the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. The MFA has a small relief from Nimrod. That's a little bit about Aster Nasser Paul. And that's who the MFA thought was represented in that particular sculpture when the sculpture was purchased in the late 1930s. How can we authenticate that object? There, there have been doubts about this object on and off over the decades. And uh, we, a number of years ago, we undertook a study. It is amber. It was uh, decorated with this gold breastplate. What can we say about the amber? We're able to prove, and it wasn't that complicated, that the amber was Baltic amber. This is a type of uh, fossilized resin that was collected on the shores of the Baltic Sea, usually the southern shores. But this is a type of um, material that was very well known even back in prehistoric times in Europe, and it was widely traded. So it's quite possible that the Assyrians could have gotten a piece of, uh, of amber like this and use it to make a sculpture. This would have been quite a large piece of amber, uh, a, a little bit larger than you typically find when you're collecting amber from the shores of the Baltic. That's, that's possibly a problem, but doesn't mean that this sculpture is not authentic. Of course, knowing this Baltic amber doesn't really tell us anything, because this is a fossilized resin that actually uh, originates from about 44 million years ago. Doesn't tell us anything about when it was carved. So we looked at the gold, and we did find that the gold is soldered together with a solder that contains the element cadmium. Cadmium is a very common component of modern gold solders. If you're, if you're working with gold uh, today, your jeweler, and you're using gold solder, it probably will have cadmium in it. But as far as we know, cadmium-containing solders were not invented until uh, the 20th century. So that strongly indicates that the, at least the breastplate is not uh, ancient Assyrian in origin. However, this sculpture, there's some ambivalence about this sculpture and some textbooks on ancient Mesopotamian art and Assyrian art still do feature this sculpture as an, as an authentic sculpture. So what can we say about these two pieces now? The MFA is ambivalent, and our records, which you can read online, for the snake goddess, for example, say that it is either from 1600 to 1500 BC or early 20th century. And same thing for the Assyrian figure. It's either, if you care to think it's original, from the 9th century BC or early 20th century. We simply weren't able to prove definitively that either of them are genuine or, or, or inauthentic. The, the ivory snake goddess could be dated, uh, could be proved to be authentic or not if we could figure out when the elephant died that supplied the ivory. But because of the contamination from wax, we can't really carry out the radiocarbon test, test that, would, that would determine that. As far as the ivory goes, it's Baltic amber, but we really want to know when the statue was carved, and there's no way of determining when the surface of this amber was carved. It's been restored a little bit, but for all we know, the surface carving could have taken place in the 9th century BC. So that's my four little stories about authentication. And uh, of course, there's millions of stories like this. There's many, many books that have been written on authentication, many, many websites. Uh, some of the stories can be a little tedious to travel through. Some of them can be uh, very uh, dramatic, others uh, less dramatic. But I thought I'd give you a little flavor of some, some real life stories in which science has been applied, modern science, but still hasn't answered the questions. And there are many instances like that where it doesn't matter how good the scientific techniques are, still can't answer the question about whether something, uh, a cultural artifact is authentic or not. And that brings us to tonight's movie. And I want to introduce the five stars. These are the ones that are listed uh, in the movie. First one, of course, is Orson Welles. You'll see a lot of him since he's in virtually every scene. He wrote it, directed it, acts, narrates it. The uh, second star is, is a woman named Oya Kodar. This is a stage name that Orson Welles uh, invented for her. 
She's a, a Croatian model and actress and a longtime companion, actually Orson Welles' companion for the last couple of decades of his life. And uh, although not credited, she probably wrote parts of the movie or co-wrote parts of the movie with Orson Welles. The third character I already introduced, that's Almar, Almir Dehori. He was a Hungarian artist, not very well known from his own art, but very well known as one of the great forgers of the last century, for sure. We don't know quite how many forgeries he actually created. He uh, also uh, forged his own biography. He invented many details about his life, which we now know are <laughs> simply not true. You'll see a lot of Elmir Dehori in the movie. That's one of Dehori's forgeries at the right, sold for $11,000 about 10 or 11 years ago, signed Gilgan in the lower right corner. The uh, fourth star is Clifford Irving. He's still alive. He's a novelist and investigative reporter. He's probably most well known for writing along with his wife a fake biography of Howard Hughes. He did this in the early 1970s. Never got published, was found out. He became very famous as a result of that. He did, however, write the real biography of Elmir Dehori, which was published in 1969, and that's called Fake, the story of Elmir Dehori, the greatest art forger of our time. That's a, that's a current picture of Clifford Irving. You'll see him in much younger days in the movie. And then the fifth star, I don't know much of anything about this fellow. He's a uh, relatively obscure French filmmaker named Francois Reichenbach. And again, I don't, I've never seen any of his movies. I don't really know much about it. I'm not even sure why he's in this particular film. <laughs> and finally, for uh, film fans, Michel Legrand wrote the music for the film. He's a very famous French composer and lot of, wrote a lot of film music, including Windmills of Our, of Windmills of Our Mind or something which uh, he wrote the music for that, which was an award-winning, maybe an Academy Award-winning uh, song from a movie, Thomas Crown Affair, maybe, which was about uh, art theft instead of forgery, but, but art-related. So with that, we come to the movie, and uh, uh, this is, I think I accurately wrote this down, this is the last thing Orson Welles says in the movie. I wish you all a very true and false good evening. Okay, well, thank you.